Hi, everybody. Welcome to Sotastic Podcast. My name is Roshan Hindia. Today, we have with us a very special guest. Her name is Missy Leo. I wanted to bring her on because she and I actually used to work together a few years back. What I found out recently just amazed me is that she has just a passion for financial literacy and she actually founded her own real estate company called Life Mission Capital. And she actually has 150 units portfolio, but her true passion is actually just uh, teaching others financial literacy, helping them join her in her journey and having success that she's had. So, Missy, thank you for joining us. How are you today? Hey, Roshan. Thank you so much. I'm so glad that we're reconnected. And yeah, I'm doing very well. It's a beautiful Saturday morning. So yes, absolutely. Thank you absolutely. for your time with me. Mm-hmm. No, no, th- thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining us. And, you know, I, 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 I love picking brains of uh, my interesting guests, and you're definitely one of our in- most interesting guests that we've had. So in, in talking with you, I can tell that you're really passionate not just about your company, but also about teaching others and helping others. But before we get started with anything else, why don't we do this? Uh, Why don't we find out a little bit about you, your professional life, and your family life a little bit? Yeah, thank you. I'm originally from China. Actually, I came to the U.S. when I was 16 as a high school exchange student. I got into college at the University of Arkansas after that and started with uh, supply chain marketing and And then started working in the supply chain field as a buyer, got into IT. And uh, during the process, I saw a knowledge gap in my skills. So I got my master's in data analytics, moved into that field, doing data analytics, got into my current company where I work full time as well, apart from my side hustle, which also I work a lot of hours towards. So right now I'm working in the data analytics field still. And during COVID time, I started my real estate company, Life Mission Capital, where I help others invest in real estate so that they can focus on what matters to them. And the whole inspiration behind it really started with myself because I'm originally from China and after coming to the U.S. at such a young age, I never really spent much time with my family. But when I first came in 2000, uh, 2009, it was just very difficult. I remember calling my family on Skype and it was getting expensive <laughs> calling them. So I just wanted to spend more time with them. I just wasn't sure if that was achievable with my nine to five job only. And in case another crisis comes, how things would be. So I wanted to really financially prepare myself. And then as I was learning about it, my friends started asking me about how to do certain things, uh, buying their first home or just some of the real estate concepts. Slowly, slowly morphed into more of a, how can I help you make sure that you're in a good situation to buy your first home or build up your credit scores? How do you understand credit cards? Um, So yeah, so it's definitely been an interesting journey just to grow myself and sharing my journey with others friends around me, or even people that I haven't really met in person, you know, they reach out to me through uh, through LinkedIn or through my social media sometimes too. No, that's awesome. Uh, but, but I was going to ask you, so you, you said uh, you have a background in supply chain, IT as well. How did you make the transition into real estate? Like, did you come from a family a background or friends background that were just a lot of like people that were into real estate? Like, how, how did you yeah. sort of get into that? Yeah. Great question. I say my father, and I'm very proud of my father, he probably planted a seed in me. In 2008-2009, he started uh, to develop a building in my hometown. And one of the reasons he wanted to do that on top of his 9 to 5 job was to provide a brighter future for his kids because I was going to study abroad and <laughs> needed some extra money for my tuitions. You know, a cost of living a lot more expensive than China. <laughs> and uh, so he started that. Um, then 2009 hit. It didn't really go as well as we planned. But I'm glad we started it because not only planted the seed, but I think overall it, it has uh, sent our family into another trajectory in terms of our uh, financial planning and also our portfolio in terms of investments as well. So that's kind of where it planted the seed. But it was uh, more of a negative seed at the beginning because I'm like, oh gosh, like, and start paying rent in my father's uh, portfolio. I was like, I don't want to live there. But slowly, I was starting to make uh, small steps in real estate with buying my first home, house hacking, buying duplexes, and investing in bigger multifamily units. The more smaller steps I take, um, I started thinking bigger and more scalable. 
And actually, one of the difference in, in the business environment in China versus here is that the business environment in the U.S. is very transparent. So there's a lot of information I can get. And because a lot of um, helpful regulations in place, it's actually a lot more transparent and a lot more trust can be built in the process. I can actually do this in a different way that was done with my family in China because I have the tools and resources. So that's kind of why it got me started, just kind of with the first home. But really, my father planted the seed. I'm very grateful for that. Wow. Okay. Okay. And you used a phrase that I, I, I would love to circle back with you on. Um, you used house hacking. Can you help me understand that phrase, please? Yeah. So house hacking is essentially where you purchase a home as a primary residence, whether it's a single family home or duplex, triplex, quadplex. Typically, you can buy a house or a uh, primary residence up to four units uh, on your personal loan. So your name, your credit scores and et cetera would be associated with it. And when you do that, if you can get your tenants whether you're renting a room with a unit with multiple rooms to pay your rent. And if it covers a certain portion of your mortgage, you're house hacking. Essentially, you're being a landlord mm-hmm. but without really, you know, just buying an investment property. I think house hacking is a great way for people to get started, especially younger people to get started into real estate investments. You're essentially buying a primary residence, whether it's a single family home or a two unit, four units. You're basically taking loan out of your personal name and using your credit, your income, to purchase that home. And you can rent out whether rooms or units within that house to help you for the mortgage. Either it's 80% of a mortgage, 50% or way more than what your actual mortgage is. You're essentially being a landlord. So you're mm. getting a taste of the investments and getting a taste of cash flow opportunities. You know, little things like that is what really helps you go and start thinking bigger. And um, a lot of parents actually took kids to college consider that they would buy a maybe investment property or maybe have their kids work a part-time job and they do a loan co-signer on the property. Mm. And then rent out the rooms and they have their kids be their proper manager. <laughs> it could be in their kid's name or their name. And it helps reduce the expenses for college because we know those college expenses aren't cheap. <laughs> it, it, it must have been scary for you to get into that not knowing whether it was going to be successful or not. Did you seek advice from somebody? Did you read up on it? Like, How did you actually get out of that anxiety that it was going to work? I think I talk to people about what I'm feeling. I'm an extrovert in general. I don't like to hold things in. And that's why pandemic is was a little difficult for me because just not being able to like, like talk to people and mm. about what I'm feeling sometimes, even though like, I talk to my husband and talk, but it's different when I get to talk to more people and just talk to people who are more experienced, have have them help me understand and knowing that I trust the experts. I had a inspector who had 25 years experience in building and also inspecting. So I was like, okay, so trust what he says. Hmm. Um, really finding people who in whose interests are aligned with yours. Hmm. Um, I wasn't completely bored with the fact that our real estate agent has the same interest as me. So I also seek the other consultations because when you're buying a home, you're the buying agent which on the contract they call it seller's agent, is essentially the one that's interacting with you, dealing with the listing agent. Their interest is to sell that home. <laughs> you know, if it's a little higher than what you want to pay, but they can transact that property in 10, 20 days and go to their next property, that's what they want. So I didn't feel like that process was a system was set up for me and for my benefits. So I stick to other consoles. So just to kind of do on due diligence check. I, I do very thorough due diligence for my other properties, my investment from now on as well. I also worked in internal audit, so kind of having that internal auditor's lenses on. (laughs) So all those things helped. Uh, You know, if you're paranoid, you can be asking a thousand questions, knowing where are the pros and cons. If the upside is so much more significant and the likelihood of bad things happening that you're imagining, like earthquake happening, is probably low, just uh, play with the risks a little bit. Because you're not like playing lottery, right? So you know, as long as you understand what the risks are, what the potential returns are, mm. you'll feel a lot more comforted. And also, if you're really stressed out, just be thinking about, well, like, what's the worst thing that can happen? It's probably not that bad. Like, if you're still healthy, if you're still able to work, and you can build a lot of things back up. So at the point for me, 
finance, yes, it's important, but the health, the relationships you have is way more important because it's so much harder to fix those things mm. than the money. Like you can build your money back. You can build mm. your financial there's your knowledge back too, but it's about the people you, you meet and the relationships you build. It's way, way more difficult to repair those and your own off. Hmm, wow. Okay. I, I love that philosophy. Okay. Good stuff. It, it sounds like financial literacy was something that's been important to you for a while. Mm-hmm. Why was it important for you to sow that financial literacy into yourself? Some of the mindset, because you obviously came to the country, you mentioned it as a high school foreign foreign exchange student, correct? Yes. You know, and, and I'm sure that that was intimidating in and of itself, trying to be essentially successful in student life, but now going from that to saying, oh, financial literacy. But at what age did you realize it was important and what was your philosophy behind it? Yeah, I'm glad you asked the question because I didn't really realize it was such a important element until probably when I got closer to graduating from college. And the reason was I was just never raised up in a way that I was taught financial literacy or knowing how to earn money or save money and invest money are important. I was taught to just study and I was just taught to graduate and go to a better school and better high school, better college and better master's degree and better job and better house. And while those concepts aren't necessarily wrong, but that's definitely not the entire story. You know, I, I understand that as a parent, a lot of times, like my dad, and especially in China, or well, maybe in countries like India, they think female is better to be a housewife at home, have a good husband, have kids, etc., etc. Well, that may not be 100% wrong for some people, depending on the life you want, but it's important to understand that there's an alternative path. I was just never exposed to that until I had to be on my own, come here as an exchange student, and more importantly, try to kind of uh, make a living on my own. The reason I say kind of is because my parents still supported me, but because it was 2009, the whole crisis, and our real estate industry wasn't really doing well, had to figure out how to make ends meet. I had to get jobs. I had to go get more scholarship. I had to make things work. And it became more like, how can I make more money so I don't have to leave like this? <laughs> and then it became more like, how can I travel more when I have a little bit more spending money? How can I get more credit card points and travel? And, and then it became more like, how can I help others to know about credit cards? Because when I after I graduated, you know, I had quite a few credit cards. I still have friends who's like credit cards. Why would you want to have so much credit cards? Like mm-hmm. how does it work? You know, I had to teach them like, it's okay to have them, but you have to be really careful what you're spending because it's so easy to spend more than what you have. Mm-hmm. So I guess it's the reason I kind of went back to my childhood, my culture. That's kind of where it started, what I didn't have and what I slowly became more knowledgeable and become an expert on. And that's what eventually got me started. Actually, I started a real estate investment club through my work at Walmart, Walmart Real Estate Investment Club, because I saw a lot of people having similar interests, Hmm. whether they're people who are, you know, higher position in the company or lower positions in the company, clubs or distribution centers. And everyone wants to have some type of financial securities Hmm. and they want to know how, how you can work for them. And my understanding and what I was building more of an expert knowledge in the real estate space. So I started that and we invite people to come and speak about it. And people can kind of relate to experiences, to the speaker's experience. And sometimes I share with my experiences too, how that can help them in their financial journey. So financial literacy is, a big, is just one piece of the puzzle, hmm. but it's one piece that's important enough that can provide a lot of securities, a lot of tax benefits and a lot of generational wealth as well. Mm-hmm. So okay. it really started with kind of where I came from, what I didn't have, what I wasn't told, to what I actually got to learn, what I can share, and what I can do more. Do you feel, mm-hmm. looking back, that traditional schools could mm-hmm. have done more to teach financial literacies to students at an early age? Because one of the, one of the things that, yes. I, that I've seen a lack of is a traditional education teaches you like basics of what checking and savings is, but that's pretty mm-hmm. much it. And mm-hmm. once you go to college, you can major in some sort of like a financial major, but it's more towards managing companies for others or managing investments for others. It's not never mm-hmm. something for yourself. So you know, help me understand yeah. just your mindset behind that. Like, where do you, where do you see some of the lack in traditional schools by your experience? Mm-hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, the school emphasizes too much on securities. It's sometimes almost conditioning us to work for corporations. Well, there's nothing wrong with that because corporations, a lot of times, like Walmart, they have a lot of scalability. Mm -hmm. Working for them in a everyday low price, it can help change people's lives. Mm -hmm. However, it's making us less likely to take risks, make make us less likely to innovate and outside the box. You know, financial literacy doesn't necessarily mean everyone goes start their own company. It could just be, mm -hmm. I still like to work as, I don't know, an auditor or a accountant, or a doctor or a cleaner. But how do I how do I leverage the skills that I have to plan the financial for for my family? It just it was never taught. One of the programs I one of the nonprofit I like to work with is called Junior Achievement. So if any of the parents are listening, any of the kids are listening, check that out, Junior Achievement. They're a nonprofit that goes into schools to help kids, mostly elementary through high school, to understand financial literacy, workforce readiness, and also entrepreneurship. You know, a few times we went there, we play fun games with the kids. We help them understand concepts like taxes, how does the city work? Uh, how can what what different career options do you have? And that's kind of my philosophy to help continue to nurture their young kids who are our future to continue to do more. While the ones that's not young, and I'm talking about high school below, we're still able to make a lot of impact through mm. our kids and also our daily decisions as well. Mm -hmm. mm. And another piece I wanted to touch on was uh, uh, think about your own philosophy. What I mean by that is I, when I was going through my personal coachings for my business, one of the things I had to get really clear on is what is my why, but not just asking it once, ask it sometimes, mm. seven whys. So why do you want to learn about financial literacy? Okay. Is it because I want to learn about it so I can pay off my credit cards. But why do you want to pay off your credit cards? I want to pay off my credit cards so I won't be under so much stress. But why 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 do you want don't want so much stress? Because I want to be more at peace and spend more time with my family. Why is that important to you? Because I value blah blah blah. So ask those seven why because it's gonna help you understand what's the real reason that you want to do what you do and keep that front and center so you can be more consistent in your learning. That's what I try to do for myself as well for my real estate company. So it can help you stay consistent, focused, and it can also give you a peace of mind knowing the bigger goal you're trying to reach rather than just trying to meet my next meal or trying to have more money. It's just on the surface level. There's more to it. Where does that get to you? It's just a tool. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So now that you've started Life Fishing Capital, help me understand the, the goals of your company. What are you trying to do with it? How are you planning to grow it to help others? So in the, in the state of realm state, you know how a lot of people think owning real estate is mostly <laughs> fixing toilets, worrying about tenants and termites and things like that. So we help people to invest in real estate without those ethics. Mm -hmm. So they can passively invest and let it become truly passive income in the real estate space. So they can focus on what matters to them, whether it's family, whether hobbies and etc. Kind of a wide glove service for those that don't want the headaches, but they want the tax benefits, the returns mm -hmm. of real estate. And from a financial literacy standpoint, we want to just educate people to become um, more aware of those topics, whether even if they're starting with more of an active investment, for example, I'm more of an active investor right now. Mm -hmm. I do do passive investment as well. Mm -hmm because I just think it's so important to have passive cash flows in case you can't work or you're not positioned to work mm. or you don't want to work because of certain life situation happens to you. You want to still have certain stream of income coming in. But right now I'm doing active investments. So helping people understand how to build your wealth we're using active and passive. But if you're at not at a point to have the time, but you want the benefits, to do passive investments. Yeah, typically we'll work with busy professionals that they just don't have time in um, figuring out those right tenants, right markets, right companies to work with, or right deal to select. It's essentially a white glove service that covers everything from acquisition to managing to exit the property. Okay, good stuff. And I know you, you're very passionate about financial literacy yourself. Can you help me understand some of the things that you're doing to continue sowing that literacy in yourself? Uh, some of the maybe uh, mm -hmm. resources that you're leading on, some of the 
mentors or coaches that you talk to? Can you help me understand how do you continue to sow into yourself? For me, what I'm continuing to do is to become more of a continue to become expert in the real estate space. That's still continuing to be my focus. What that means is like looks like the rich that poor that is definitely, you know, a go to for any entrepreneurs when you yeah. when thinking about finances. And also who now how. Um, it's also a great book because anytime you run into a problem, it's not about how to resolve it, but rather who can you get with in helping you solve that problem that has a different sort of skill set or passion than you have. I also listen to different podcasts, but it's mostly um, episode specific depending on the topic. But some of the listeners, you could check out Bigger Pockets if you haven't. I think it's a great place to get started for people. Mm-hmm. I'll also be launching my own personal podcast uh, in the future called Invest with a Mission hmm. that will talk about how to invest in commercial real estate, which is an area sometimes people think it's so difficult to break into, but it's hmm. actually not that difficult with the group purchase model that we have. And also from a personal investment side, I have two coaches. One is on just general real estate investments. He is a CCIA certified commercial real estate investment member in Monroe. So he is real estate market analysis in underwriting that helps. and so I can leverage him and also my analytical skills to help myself and also my investors to mm-hmm. make sure we get a good deal throughout through underwriting. Another one I another coach I have is Hunter Thompson, Raise Capital for Real Estate. He's been doing this I think close to a decade right now, maybe a little bit more than a decade mm-hmm. in the raising capital for real estate because once you start doing your own business with real estate investments, it's usually two two areas you need to start the opportunity. It's uh, you need to deal with the money. So if you have the deal but don't have the money, how do you find the capital through investors, institutional investors, different places that you can acquire the funds? Hmm. And uh, yeah, so those are the two major places that I that I have hmm. for um, mentorship. Mm-hmm. No, oh, and that's that's amazing because uh, that's something I've learned about successful uh, people in the the financial world is that they don't just have a know it all I've arrived syndrome. They are actually somebody that continue to seek out knowledge through books and podcasts and you know YouTube videos and whatnot. But also, how do you use your mentors effective? I'm so so happy to hear that you actually have two mentors that you lean on that you can count on to give you right advice, to give you the right mindset. That's amazing. That's awesome. I'm going to end uh, with this last question that I love asking all guests. Okay, if you could mm-hmm. turn back time and talk to your kid self, to your younger self, what advice mm-hmm. would you give her about developing that financial thought process earlier on? I would say, because when I was younger, I still recall maybe when that rabbi came here a few years before I came to the United States, I had set this goal on a piece of paper saying, I'm going to have this much money by, by this age, have this many companies and this many houses, et cetera, et cetera. That's awesome. While those goals are, while those goals are nice, I think another thing to think about is how to get there a little bit and mm-hmm. whether not necessarily not necessarily struggling with how, but understanding the components that can help you get there. And uh, reaching out and learning from people um, in that space as well. I think when I when I was younger, I didn't necessarily know those people or resources. So I would say if I were to give advice, I would say start talking with people who are successful in the areas you want to go to, even though if they're younger than you, older than you, I think those relationships, if I had made them earlier, I would have thought about the world differently versus just going through the traditional path and um, until the rubber hit the road, uh, I'm like, oh, wow, I'm actually kind of far from where I want to be. (laughs) And then you start thinking about how to get there. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's awesome. That's awesome. Awesome, Missy. You've been very insightful. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your time, your knowledge, and your expertise. And I I know... uh, it sounds like just talking just strictly about your passion and the meaning that you've attached to it. I know that uh, Life Mission Capital will be, it's already good. It's going to continue to be great throughout the future. I wish you all the best with it, but thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Roshan. Pleasure is mine. Thank you. The ideas, techniques, approaches, 
information and opinions expressed in this video or podcast are solely those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent those of Sotastic LLC and its employees. While the primary purpose is to educate and inform, it does not constitute professional advice or services. We hope, however, that the content presented here will assist you in developing a strong financial understanding and mindset. You may not edit, modify, copy, or redistribute this video or podcast with any other website, computer, or playing device. Use of this video or podcast constitutes acceptance of these terms.